He's the gloriously gory Italian horror maestro whose nearly 50 year career in cult movies earned the respect of adoring fans and high profile filmmakers alike. In the latest installment of Arrow in the Head's Horror Hall of Fame, we take a look at the uncompromising career of the godfather of gore, Lucio Fulci. And we start working. He, in reality, he's, I would say he's one of the most creative directors I have worked with. Born into a modest upbringing and mostly raised by a single mother in 1920s Rome, Lucio was somewhat shaped by the political climate of the time. As a teenager, he would quickly grow into a socially conscious, politically active citizen due to the volatile post-war years in which he found himself as a young adult. Despite initially studying medicine, his interest in the arts would eventually see him carry out work as an art critic before brushing up his skills in screenwriting and assistant directing at a film school in Rome. But all great students need their mentors. And for Fulci, it was the famed director Stefano Venzina who would give the bright-eyed film student his first big break on a string of Italian comedy films, a genre which Fulci would cut his teeth on during his first directing gigs before making the jump to the world of giallo. At the time, giallo was a firmly established horror subgenre, but Fulci would find himself among a new wave of Italian maestros like Umberto Lenzi and the one and only Dario Argento. His first foray into the genre, one on top of the other, was an American set story of marital betrayal, which is said to be an early inspiration for 90s erotic thrillers like Basic Instinct and Body of Evidence. The year in which the film was released, 1969, was a tough one for Fulci, having tragically lost his wife to suicide following a devastating cancer diagnosis she'd received. It sadly wouldn't be an isolated event for Fulci, who experienced more than his fair share of heartbreak over the years. As he set out into the world as a fully-fledged horror director, he would quickly establish some recognisable trademarks, the first of which being his gloriously graphic violence. He had a particular attraction to mutilating the human eye in all manner of elaborate ways, and on his second giallo, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, his frighteningly realistic depiction of mutilated dogs would see him falsely accused of animal cruelty, with the dogs in question turning out to be extremely convincing creations from his special effects team. The other notable theme of his films was the none too subtle disdain shown towards the Catholic Church. This was despite the fact that Fulci himself was actually raised Catholic and even referred to himself as such. The sexually charged Beatrice Sensi was a prime example of this, with the public outcry almost enough to derail his career before it had even begun. Like many of his peers, he would dip his toe into the world of spaghetti westerns with both Four of the Apocalypse and Silver Saddle, but these were but stepping stones on his way back to the horror genre, upon which time he would double down on the gore for 1972's Don't Torture a Duckling, a film which would only receive limited release throughout Europe due to its confronting themes. The late 70s would bring with it his first big international hit, albeit under abnormal circumstances. Zombie 2, while a horror film featuring, yes, zombies, and carrying the same name as the Italian release of Dawn of the Dead, wasn't, in fact, an official sequel to Romero's runaway hit. The misleading marketing campaign for the film was done without the permission of either Fulci or Romero, but the intended result was still achieved. With the film spawning several sequels, it was here that Fulci would begin his long-time creative partnership with composer Fabio Frizzi, with the two working together for the bulk of the next decade. Along with the prog rock of Goblin and the compositions of John Carpenter, Fritzi's music themes remain some of the most beloved in horror movie history. As, as for every film genre, I, uh, I think that a good horror movie is a, is a good movie. It would also be remiss of us to talk about Zombie 2 and not mention its notorious shark battle, in which author and underwater photographer Ramon Bravo donned the zombie makeup and took on a tiger shark. For real. What makes this scene even more remarkable is that Fulci went on the record to say he was against the idea altogether, believing it would simply be too silly for the film. As a result, shooting would fall to second unit, who would go on to pump the shark in question full of tranquilizers to ensure it was placid enough to perform the shots required. 
the success of Zombie 2 meant that the door to the American market was now somewhat open to Fulci. But with the new territory came new challenges, and that meant censoring a great deal of the director's trademark violence. An R rating would mean larger audiences, but more brutal cuts, while an X rating would guarantee Fulci's vision remain intact at the expense of more people seeing his work. The alternative was to release the films unrated, which is exactly how much of Fulci's work was discovered on the grindhouse circuit over the years. You created it. We worked on it. The new world and the new cycle have begun. The newfound notoriety from Zombie 2 helped kickstart an extremely productive period for Fulci's career throughout the 80s, with a raft of films following in quick succession, including the likes of The Black Cat, The New York Ripper, Manhattan Baby, as well as his Gates of Hell trilogy. Beginning with 1980's City of the Living Dead and concluding with 1981's The House by the Cemetery, the three films were inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft and leaned heavily on supernatural themes. The second chapter, titled The Beyond, is notable for its troubled release history, receiving a different title, alternate music score, and shorter running time in the US, and winding its way onto the notorious Video Nasties list in the UK. In spite of this, the film has garnered praise from a raft of high-profile filmmakers over the years, with Quentin Tarantino helping screen the film in its original form to US audiences for the first time, some 17 years after its initial release. While Zombie was in many ways the film series that helped make Fulci's name, it was also the one that would almost break him. When the filmmaker travelled to the Philippines with his daughter to make Zombie 3, he probably didn't imagine he'd be returning six weeks later, having been hit by illness, clashed with producers, and changed a large chunk of the script that resulted in the film clocking in at a measly 50 minutes after its final edit. The studio would eventually bring in another director to turn the lean running time into something more closely resembling feature length. Sadly, this would mark somewhat of a turning point for both Fulci's personal and professional life, some of which was echoed in the metamusings of his 1990 film, A Cat in the Brain, starring a fictionalized version of the director himself. Films. I've read all the scripts, the screenplays, the notes. I understand now why you're in this state of confusion. Everything and anything having to do with horror is there. The last decade of Fulci's life would be marred by health issues, with the liver problems that had begun to surface on Zombie 3 continuing to plague the ailing director, as well as an ongoing battle with diabetes. There would be some joy in these later years, with Fulci and Dario Argento, two men who had once been adversaries in the giallo genre, pledging to collaborate on a film together. Fulci would begin to write Wax Mask, but his dreams of directing the project would be cut short when he finally succumbed to diabetes-related complications on March 13, 1996 at the age of 68. In a sign of their mutual respect for one another, Argento would pay for the late director's funeral costs. And while much of Fulci's life was marred by tragedy, the outpouring of love he received in death would be fitting for a filmmaker so filled with passion for his craft. And I do know that he just didn't give a hell about the English version. He did not care. He says, that has nothing to do with me. Mine is the Italian version. I don't care what you do with it. Uh, dub it into Japanese or whatever you want. Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content. And turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support. <laughs>